this time of year that we are that we're going through now that has certain <coughs> currents of energy, if you like, that are <coughs> operating now, and we need to understand <coughs> the basis of, of what that means. Before we we look specifically at the nature of this particular time of the year, maybe next week we'll, we'll be able to look a bit more deeply at that. Let's try to study together the basic idea of the flow of time and <coughs> what, it, what it brings or what it means, what it does. There are two real components to this discussion. One is the theory, that means the idea, what, what time is and what it carries, if you like, and then there's the practical component, which is what we need to, why we need to know this, apart from the fact that we are studying Torah together, which is, which is its own justification. But practically, what's the practical output? What can you do with, with this knowledge? And how is that appropriate to this time of year? What decisions should be made now? What should you think about perhaps taking on in your own life? A special reason to think critically along those lines now. Last week we discussed the idea of a general assessment and a specific assessment of each individual reality, what it is that you're doing here, where it is that you're going. (coughs) There's also the question of timing. (coughs) Not just an assessment of who you are, but last week we said that when a business plans its activities, it does it in an organized fashion. It chooses goals and it makes methods of assessment of those goals. And similarly, it also makes a decision about timing. When is the right time to make a move? When's the right time to invest? When's the right time to divest oneself of certain, certain interests? So let's, let's try to put this in perspective. Deep subject, like everything else in Torah, Let's try to give it a framework. (coughs) First of all, (coughs) that's that's the most basic (coughs) element to understand here, is that time is causative. Time is not an environment through which we move. Time is the body that, that ripples and gives expression to the soul that's within that body. To put it as basically as possible, the world thinks, the secular world, the non-Jewish world thinks that time is a medium. Time is a, is, is a, um, it's a matrix through which you, within which you, and through which you move. And things imprint themselves on time as you go through. But we have an understanding that's very different from that. Our understanding is that time is a flow of energy that has nodes or ripples, and those ripples bring into being the things that come into being at those times. Actually, we have the same notion about space as well. That, that just, uh, just as there are special nodes in time that make things possible, <coughs> certain places in space that make things possible as well. Perhaps we'll have some time, some ability to talk about that, maybe next week or some other time. But time is the cause, if you like. If, and if not the cause of events, it's certainly the energy that makes them possible even if it takes our interaction with, with that medium of time to make the thing happen, but it's only, we can only do that at certain spaces in time, certain places in time, because the energy is that way at that particular time. Not clear, huh? <coughs> Let, let's try and put it more sharply. When we do certain things at certain times, for example, this time of year, we go through a mourning period, we don't eat meat now, we don't, we don't buy new things, we have an intensifying mourning period that culminates next week. We are celebrating, in a negative sense, certain things that happened in the past. When we go through Pesach and we celebrate the idea of freedom and we live it, we relive it, that's what's current at that time. The non-Jewish notion or the secular notion is that the reason that we do it then is because that's when it happened. Yes? That's what they call an anniversary. The anniversary of something is when the time rolls around, so we remember the event because it happened at that time. 
Why do we celebrate Pesach in the springtime when we do exactly when? Because that's when the exodus from Egypt happened. We went out of Mitzrayim then, we went out of Egypt then, and since it happened at that time, so that's the time to celebrate it, right? You, you, you look forward to your, or you celebrate, or maybe you don't look forward to your birthday or whatever it is, because um, there, something special happened at that time. And therefore, when the time comes around again, it brings back a reminder, a re-energizing of that consciousness, and so you relive that time. That's not a Jewish idea at all. Not at all. It's a completely meaningless, sentimental idea. It's nothing to do with Judaism. The Jewish idea is not that we celebrate that this event, this event is celebrated now because it took place then. Our idea is that it took place then because that was the time. Our idea, our concept is that Pesach happens when it happens during the year because that's the time of year that makes it possible. It rides on the crest of a wave that is that idea. And that's what happens then. We didn't go out of Egypt at that time as it happens, and so we celebrate it again now. We went out of Egypt at that time because that's when it was possible to go out of Egypt. It couldn't have happened at any other time. That, 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 that crest of a wave of transcendence that happened then, that is what's called freedom, that happens in the world at that time of year. And we rode the wave that was riding, that was, that was moving anyway at that time. You don't look convinced. Let me, let me give you one or two practical examples. Pesach, for example, happens in the spring, right? Just as an example. What do we do at Pesach? We eat matzah, for example. Right? We eat matzah, we make, a, we make a Pesach Seder. Why? Because in commemoration of the exodus from Egypt, everybody knows that. But if you look in our sources, you'll notice that when Abraham, Abinu, Abraham was living in the desert, many, many generations before there was a Jewish nation, he was the precursor, the forerunner, the father of the Jewish people, centuries before, and many generations before there was a people, right? He ate matzah on Pesach. In fact, our source is very, very clear that when the three angels, three malachim, came to Greek, came to meet him, came to visit him, he hosted them, he fed them matzah, because it was Pesach. Now that, that requires understanding. He fed them matzah, Pesach. Matzah we eat because when we went out of Egypt, there was no time for the bread to rise. That's what everybody knows. And that's what you said at your Pesach side, didn't you? Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you said, right, that we eat this unleavened bread, because we left Egypt in, in haste, there was no time for... Why were the non-Jews nodding? Excuse me. That's interesting. The, we, we went out of... We went out of Egypt. We went out of Israel in a rush. There was no time for the bread to rise. And therefore, we, we commemorate that by eating matzah. But it's not so. Matzah is at that time of year. It's required spiritually. Somebody sensitive to the world would know that this is what you have to do now. <coughs> Abraham Avinu, back in that generation, before there was a Jewish people, there was no Egypt that had enslaved us. It hadn't happened yet. He was eating matzah, making, making the observances of Pesach at that time of year. Why? Because he understood the world. And he looked into the world, and he was able to deduce and infer from the, from the framework of the world that this is a time, this is called Pesach. He knew then that we'd go out of Egypt later then, because that was, yeah, at that time of year, that is when the wave is moving, and you have to ride it at that time if you wish to take Make use of that energy. It's not that the event happened then, so we celebrate it then. That was the time, and that's why the event happened. This time of year is a dangerous time now. Not because historically it so happened that bad things happened around this time. So now we put ourselves back into that negative framework. It's not like that. This is intrinsically a dangerous time of year. It has a lucky gramification. Certain things you should not do now. Definitely certain things you should not do now. It's not a, it's not a good time for us. It will be eventually this summer, but now the summer is not good. The astrological forces are against us. It's a very dangerous time, intrinsically. And that's why bad things have happened at this time. Not because they happened to happen then, so we remember it now. This is the time for it, and it brings those things into existence. The time, in other words, is the, is the, is the, is the substrate that gives expression to the energy that flows within it. It's for this reason, incidentally, that time is regarded as feminine. The woman is the one who brings to expression in the world. Man is only capable of beginnings. Man, the male, maleness means only the power of beginnings. But femaleness is the power of bringing to expression. Man doesn't form a child, he only gives half a genetic code, that's all. It's the woman who does the entire formation, she gives full expression, incidentally, that's why he does not, his does not involve time, and hers involves the full cycle of time. A woman is an expression of time. The word zman in Hebrew, the word zman means, zimun in Hebrew means ready for, able to, it means invited or ready. A 
obviously, I mean, this doesn't need to be spoken out, obviously, this is the reason that women are related to time. This is why women are related to time. Men are not related to time. Men are completely out of the world of time. And women are geared into the world of time. In, in, hal- in ha- halakhic terms, women are exempt from all mitzvahs that are time-bound. Women are exempt from all mitzvahs that are time-bound. Yes, women, men and women in Judaism are obliged in the same mitzvahs, except <coughs> for mitzvahs that are positive mitzvahs that are bound by time, or caused, occasioned by time. All negative commands, women are obliged exactly the same as men. Right? Not to do the negative things in the world, a woman has to be as knowledgeable and as strong as, ma- as a man does, or perhaps we have to say men have to be as strong as women can be, in keeping themselves away from those negative things. It's always been now it's tradition that women have had the strength in difficult times when men did not. That's not our issue now. It's probably a misprint anyway. The point is that <coughs> the point is that uh, in negative commands we're all obliged equally. But positive commands, and last week I think we discussed the difference between positive and negative commands, Positive commandments, which are those that build the world, <coughs> women are obliged only in those that are not time-bound. They're, they're, ex- they're outside of time. <coughs> the ones that are occasioned by time, mitzvahs that have to be done at certain times, almost all of those women are exempt. There are some particular exceptions for particular reasons. But apart from those, women are not obliged in those mitzvahs. Why? Why? The conventional anti-Semitic explanation is that women have obligations. You can't oblige a woman to do a certain thing at a certain time because she has to look after children, she's responsible for a family. And naturally, a woman is children are dependent on her. Children may be dependent on the father, but it's not built into the nature of the relationship, right? She nurtures and she suckles and she's, she's beholden, as it were, to those who depend on her. And therefore, you cannot oblige her at a certain time. That is not a spiritual explanation. It may be true and it may be wise and so forth, but the essence is that a woman is not obliged in time-bound mitzvahs because she's already locked into time. What a mitzvah does, a mitzvah is a homework exercise in self-development, that's all. A mitzvah is a personal exercise in growth. A mitzvah is a building of that part of your neshama that hasn't been built yet, that's why we do it. Right? Mitzvah, we, we, the word mitzvah again means that which bonds you into togetherness. The word mitzvah in Hebrew doesn't mean, we translate it as command. It has that connotation. But the root of the word mitzvah in Hebrew, the tzavta, tzavta chada in Aramaic means in one bond. In the modern Hebrew tzavet, which is exactly the same word, means a crew or a team. It means people who operate as one. Different people who operate as one. Mitzvah means it bonds you into a higher world. You obviously need to be bonded in where you're not bonded in. So you do the exercise of putting yourself in. But a woman is already bonded into that world. She doesn't need it. She already has that. Of course she can do those mitzvahs. And she gets reward for them. But she doesn't get nearly as much as reward as a man because she doesn't have the effort to put in there. It's already a natural talent. It's, uh, you see it in practice, of course. I mean, uh, you see it in practice. I mean... Women have to dub in every day, for example, prayer, right? Prayer is an obligation for women. But they're not time-bound like men are. Men have to dub in at certain fixed times, not three times a day, at least. A woman has to connect with Hashem at some stage in a certain, a certain way. She has to, but at any time. And the fact is that women do it. Women do it. Women who know about it, they do it. Where do they fit it in? They fit it in, they get it done. If a man, if you told a man to do it, just to fit it in, for sure the last moment would come and he'd be scrambling and not have gotten near it yet. <laughs> There's a certain time discipline, a certain connection with time, and that's why a woman's body cycles with time. You know that the expression of the body that cycles with time is something that modern medicine has got no approach to. Modern science hasn't the beginnings of an explanation, it's not even a theory, of why that cycle operates. You know that the, all other biological cycles are, have at least some physiological, they, they have at least some scientific or physical connection. If it's a, day, a daily cycle, then it's connected to heat and cold or light and dark variation. If it's, a, if it's a seasonal cycle, it's connected to seasonal changes. But the monthly cycle that cuts across day-night variation, it cuts across seasons, is a remarkable thing. Unbelievable thing. The only, the only physical concept, the only physical element in the universe that it could possibly be connected to is the moon. Right? That the ovary is connected to the moon, <coughs> which is a spiritual teaching. Medicine hasn't begun to even theorize about how that might happen. And how a cycle could be so sensitively tuned to something that there isn't the beginning of a scientific explanation. It's a completely spiritual connection. Again, there may be some, again, they may discover, not to say they won't discover some, some physical connection and there's no reason why they shouldn't be. In fact, on the contrary, it's our teaching that the spiritual forces in the world ride on physical 
energies, there's no reason, probably they just haven't discovered it yet, but it's an incredibly refined connection. <coughs> incredibly refined. Today, it's not as... Gimona says that women are not... Their bodies are not as regular as they used to be. So women, when human beings are on a higher level, then, then that clock that worked internally, which is incredibly accurate even now, inexplicably accurate, but then it was so accurate, almost indescribable. Even today, the, the post can talk about a cycle that a woman can have that's a monthly cycle that goes by the date of the month. You know what that means? That means a fixed cycle, a fixed, you know what this means? A fixed cycle, where the cycle lasts not a certain number of days, but recurs on the same date of the month. If it's the 4th of Tammuz, it'll be the 4th of, the 4th of Av, and it'll be the 4th of Elul, and the 4th of Tishrei, even though the months have different number of days. The Hebrew months have different number of days, longer and shorter, but it makes no difference. She'll cycle on the same date. Why? Because that truly reflects the moon state. So the body will be sensitive to that. Today it's unusual to find that kind of regularity. But that's not the point. The point is that there's an expression of time that is in the womanly construction. And that's why time is considered to be the vessel or the, or the mode of expression, the vessel that gives expression to the light of the higher world. Space is also the same thing on another plane. Our teaching is that the world has three dimensions, what's called Ashan. Ashan means whatever it means. But the three letters of Ashan mean Elam, Shana, Nefesh. Elam means the world of space. Shana means the world of time. And Nefesh means the world of the human spirit. Those are three completely separate dimensions. The human soul doesn't fit into either of those categories. It operates within it. So time is the vessel that gives expression to the energies that flow through it, and it brings them to the fore, and one has to be sensitive to that so that one can ride the energies. You need to know, if you're a surfer, then you will want to get up on your board at the time when the wave... You're not going to make much progress trying to surf when the wave isn't there, or going the other way. It doesn't work. That's what surfing was created for, was to teach you the spiritual... <laughs> no, it's like all the rest of the, uh, like all the rest of physicality. <laughs> but uh, that's what it's for. When there's a wave that's rising, so then that's the time to rise and have that wave carry you. Time is a sequence of waves, each of them coming when it does and doing what it does. And the sense of the shaman, the sense of the soul, is utilizing that. that Energy. Again, women are much more sensitive. Rosh Chodesh, for example, is a special altar for women. They should observe it. They should do special things on that day. We should all take notice of Rosh, even Rosh Chodesh as a tradition to dress in Shabbos clothing. The altar clothing on Rosh Chodesh. But it's a, it's a special gift that we're given, it was given to women because they have that intrinsic connection with time and therefore the celebration of the month itself, the idea of month, which is Chodesh in Hebrew, which obviously means Chadash, means newness. It's a co- constant rejuvenation, which is what the moon represents, as opposed to the solar calendar, which is the non-Jewish calendar. The solar calendar we call Shana. Shana means the year. Shana. Shana in Hebrew means a repetition. It means the same thing again and again and again. It's a repetition. And Chodesh is exactly the opposite. It means that it's not the repetition of the same thing. It means it's a new thing that's born each month through a radically different idea. There's a point of connection, which is why we make the calendars connect each year. But that's another subject for another time where our two worlds meet. But the point is that our world is the world of rejuvenation, recrudescence, that, that, that renaissance that happens every, every month. That's what month is. That's why Chodesh, Chadash, and Chodesh are Now, if this is true, if this is true, then obviously one needs to know how to ride that way. There are many deep ideas here. One of them is that obviously if a time is taking place, then what must happen then will happen then. <coughs> and if you make your moves then, what, you, what you'll be doing is you'll be fitting in with what's happening. You may have the impression that you're doing it, <coughs> and you'll be held accountable, <coughs> as if you did it. But in fact, all that happens is that which had to happen anyway. Not only that, even if you choose your place, you'll find that it in fact was chosen... Not with me. I'll... I'll let me share with you what the Gemara says about this, which is utterly frightening. I mean, this is really, really frightening. The Gemara gives the following example. We want to illustrate now the interaction between free will. That means you make the moves you have to move, and you do what you have to do in the world. And ultimately, you then are shown that this is what had to be. You're fully accountable, because you made your move. But there's an energy that's running through the creation, which is making this thing take place anyway. And the two intersect. The way the Gemara puts it is a remarkable expression. The Gemara says... Gemara in Sukkah, in the fifth parak, you can look it up yourself. The Gemara says, Ragloi de Bar Inish, 
Inun Arufin by an incredible expression. Ragloi de Bar Inish, the legs of a person. Inun Arufin by, they are your guarantors. An Araf is a person who secures a loan. A guarantor for a loan. He makes sure that you pay, if not he pays. Right? That's a guarantor for a loan. The legs of a human being, a person's legs, are his guarantors. And what it means is that you walk, but your legs take you. You walk to where you think you need to be walking. In fact, it's your legs carrying you. Are you with me? You make a decision, you're going to a certain place. In fact, what happens is that you are going to where you have to be going anyway. The expression legs in Torah, again, this is a deep subject. Legs always mean the part of the body that has no thought. Legs are always, in the Kabbalistic writings, the legs are called Labar Migufa. That means they're outside the body. The body ends where the legs begin. The legs are not part of the body, Kabbalistically. The legs are the, the vehicles that carry the... The arms are also not part of the body. They're the, expre- the organs of expression of the body. They go out and do what the body does. The legs are the things that carry a person through the world. They are not you yourself. They're the vehicle or agent that carries you. The wonderful proofs of this in Torah. Perhaps for some other time. But the legs are... There are many things, uh, a lot of it is not appropriate for them to go into it. Uh, some Kabbalistic sources say it's why when a woman is in labor, she cannot walk. It means when new life is about to appear, so then the, the extraneous parts become, become cold. Uh, but the legs are, legs are external to the body. They don't have any part of the consciousness of the body. Incidentally, it's beautiful in Hebrew. Again, Hebrew says it all. The word for a habit in Hebrew is hergel, means that which the leg does. Amazing thing. Habit. Habit means that which you do without thinking. That's what a habit is. A habit is something that runs on automatic, not something you have to do consciously. The Hebrew in English, habit means habit. But in Hebrew, habit means that which the legs do. Hergel, the part that the legs do. That means you don't need to think. Your legs take you there because you go out of habit. Sometimes you walk to a place out of habit, you don't intend to go there at all. You, you wonder why you're there. You're there because you always go there. This time you didn't want to go there, but you were that's the point. You weren't thinking. Your legs took you. That's called Hergel. The legs did it. So, Ragloi the Barinish, the legs of a person, the legs of a person are your guarantors. Yes? They take you where you have to go. The example the Gemara gives is this one. It says that one day, King Solomon, Shlomo Melech, Shlomo Melech saw the angel of death. Right? He saw Chazi the Malach He saw the angel of death. He was sad. The angel of death, the Malach Whenever he appears, it means he has to take someone's life, right? He comes, the Gemara says you can tell when he's in town, because the dogs behave in a certain fashion. <coughs> Shalom didn't need those signs, he could see him directly. He was the wisest of all men. And when the Malachim Abbas appeared, Shalom saw that he was sad. A sad countenance. So Shalom walked up to the Malachim Abbas and he asked him, what are you sad about? And what do you say? He was the wisest of all men. His, his drive was to understand everything that could be understood. So here was an opportunity to study, to learn. He went up to the Malachim Abbas and said to him, why are you sad? So the Malachim Abbas said that I'm sad because I've been sent to take two people. I've been sent to take the souls, to take the Nishamas, yes? Two people have to die. I've been sent to take them, and I'm unable to take them. And he quoted their names. He quoted their, two, their, their names, these two individuals whom he was sent to take. Shlomo recognized their names. They were close friends. They were, they were close associates of his. They, they worked with him, and they, they were scribes of his. And they were very, very beautiful people. They were spiritually very beautiful people. And in order, so what Shlomo did when he heard that the Malach Amalis was trying to get them, he had them transported instantaneously to a town called Luz. Luz is an amazing idea, again, to take a whole discussion in its own right. But Luz is a town in which no one can die. Luz is a town that's impervious to the Malach Amalis. He's not allowed to go in there. Right? That's Luz. Luz is the town where the Malach Amalis cannot, well, they're all very deep ideas here. This is not to be understood on a childish level. But there's a, there's, a, there's a space or a place called Luz. It's also, incidentally, the name of the bone. Luz is the name of the bone at the base of the spine, the base of the neck, which is the bone... Well, you don't want to know. Anyway, the point is that this town called Luz is... Um, this bone here, yeah, is the bone that is the part that doesn't decompose after the body disintegrates. When the body decomposes, even if it decomposes, even to the extent of the bones decomposing, there's a spiritual, uh, a mystical idea that that bone is always remaining intact, and the resurrection will take place from that bone. It's the part that cannot die. You understand the connection? It's the part that even when everything else decomposes, there's always got, there has to always be a speck of life left so that there can be a recrudescence of life. It must always be that, right? At the very, very deep center, yeah, at that which holds the head, there must be a spark of... In fact, the Gemara says that this bone called the Luz is sustained by the food you eat on Matzah Shabbos. 
Malava Malka, that special meal that we eat when Shabbos goes out. Right? You know, you should eat three meals on Shabbos, a very important thing. They want to say tremendous spiritual things about that. And on Saturday night, after the sun goes down, you have a special meal. Many people like candles. <coughs> and you have a thing called the Malava Malka. Malava Malka means a, um, accompanying the queen. Just like the Shabbos queen comes in and spreads her white, her white presence over the world on Shabbos, and we bring her in with a welcoming that we do with Kiddush, we also see her out with that royal accompaniment that we see out with a special meal. And that's called Malava Malka. The Gemara says that the meals you eat on Matzah Shabbos on Saturday night, those are the meals that sustain this bond. The nourishment of that food sustains this bond. What's the concept? What's the connection? The obvious, the connection is obvious. The connection is that Matzah Shabbos, Saturday night, is the moment of rebirth of the week. Shabbos is the end of the week, right? The world was created on Sunday. Remember that? The world was created on the first day of the week. And Shabbos was the culmination of creation. So Shabbos was when the week ended. So when Shabbos ends, you come to the end of the cycle entirely. The next week is a spiral that has moved up. Yes, the next week, the next, next Sunday, next day, first day of the week, is the, is, is the moment when the previous reality has ended, and there's a rebirth of a higher reality that comes out of the ashes, out of the components of the previous cycle. Jewish, Jewish concept of time is not that it's a circle, it's a big mistake. People think that you cycle through time. You don't cycle through time, you spiral through time. Time is not, it's very important. Time is not a circle that you revisit places that you were at before. You revisit a place higher than you were before at the same point. It's a spiral. When you get back to the same point in the spiral, there's the same energy that was there before. But it's a higher, it's a higher ring than it was before. There'd be no point in going through time again and again and again. That's you're just getting older. The concept is that you go through the same energies, but on a higher level, it's a spiral. If you're not spiraling, you're in big trouble. That's the concept. That's what we say. Bayomi mahem bazmanaze. In those days at this time, in those days, this thing happened at this time of year. Down there in the spiral, the base of the spiral, that's when this occurred. Matzah Shabbos is when the week is reborn. At that moment when the, re- when the week is reborn is a moment of resurrection. And therefore, the meals, that, the meals that you eat then are the energy that sustains the part of you that is the part that is involved in the resurrection, right? That's what this is. Incidentally, that's how we don't cremate people. It's one of the most important reasons why we do not cremate people. Unfortunately, many Jews don't know that. It's one of the reasons. So Luz is the concept of life that cannot be destroyed. The town of Luz is a town in which the Malach Mavis cannot enter, and there can, people cannot die. So when Shlomo found, when the Malach Mavis said to him, that he was come to take these two people, he had them transported by certain techniques. How he did it is, again, you can look up yourself, also a whole mystical discussion for another time. But he had them transported instantaneously, without any time delay at all, to the gates, to the city of Luz, so that they could be protected within the city, and their lives could be saved. The Gemara says that as they arrived at the gates of Luz, they both died. They both died. As they arrived at the gates, before they could enter, they both died. The next day, Shlomo saw the Malach Mavis, the Kabadich. He was happy. He was in a joking mood. The angel of death was walking around a beat. So Shlomo walked up to him and said to him, What are you happy about today? So Malach Mavis said to him, You know why I was so upset yesterday? You know those two people I was sent to take? My instructions, you know why I was so upset? My instructions were to take them at the gates of Luz and I couldn't get them there. So you see, he utilized his free will to do what he had to do. And he did a big thing. He tried to save lives. There's no bigger mitzvah in the Torah than that. There's virtually no bigger mitzvah in the Torah than that. He used his free will to save lives. And he played into the hands of death. There's no question that he will be rewarded for having tried to save lives. What else was he, What are you supposed to do? So you do what you have to do. But it moves into the channel, which is what has to be done. Of course, you realize in retrospect, the whole story... After you reanalyze this pathway, your whole life takes on a completely different... Because now you realize, the day when you saw the Malach is walking around sad, that wasn't accidental. The Malach is put on a sad face. You know why? He knew how to get them to the gates of Luz. And he knew how to get it done somehow. So how he's going to do it? He decided to use Shlomo. So what did he do? All he had to do was appear in front of him and look sad. And he knew that he'd take care of the rest of it for him. It means he was being utilized the whole way. He was being used from beginning to end. But he did what he had to do. He couldn't have known that. 
This doesn't mean that we're not, yeah, no, be very careful. We don't, we don't, this is not a fatalism that denies free will. On the contrary, absolutely on the contrary, nothing like that. Nevertheless, there are currents moving that have to move. The Gemara says, for example, when a person has to die, that can't be prolonged. <coughs> it cannot be prolonged. It can be foreshortened, that's for sure. It can be foreshortened. Death can be foreshortened. It can be brought closer because human beings are extremely dangerous. Human beings are extremely dangerous. But it can never be delayed. And the Gemara says, when the time comes, that's been allotted, that's an absolute fixed point. No matter what has to be constructed, no matter how bizarre the circumstances that have to be constructed, that will happen exactly then. Now, <coughs> you set out to do what you have to do. But what happens is what, have to, what has to happen. You know, two weeks ago we read the Sedra of Masai. Can you handle the digression for a few minutes? Yes? Not sure. <laughs> well, let's, yeah, can we handle the subject a bit more broadly? We, we read Masai. Masai, interesting, the Pasha begins like this. Let's think this theme through. The Pasha says, Eile moitsaem le Masaim. These are the goings out for their travelings. And these are their travelings for their goings out. Look up the first pasuk, the first couple of sukkim in, in, in Marseille, the Pasha of Marseille we read. It talks about the Jews travelling in the desert, which is really the prototype for, for all spiritual journeys. The concept of Marseille is the, the number of stages that the Jewish people visited through their travels in the desert, which is like the metaphor and the, the archetype, the prototype for all spiritual journeys that were going from Egypt to Israel, right? which is the concept of spiritual aliyah. And when it describes their journeys, which is really describing all spiritual path, all spiritual pathways, it says these are the amazing thing. These are their goings out for their travelings. <coughs> these are their journeyings for their exits, for their goings out. And then it reverses it. And it says, and these are their goings out for their travellings. What does that mean? The Torah doesn't repeat any words. <coughs> the Rosh Hashimah of Gates said used to say, of Gobitz used to say, it means that when you go out, listen to this amazing thing, when you go out on a journey, you go into a place where you have to be. You don't know that. You think you're going to the place where you think you're going, but you aren't going there at all. You're going to the place where, <laughs> where you have to be. You set out for that purpose, but that isn't where you're going. Only after you get there, then you have to look back and see why you left. That isn't what you thought it was for. <laughs> example. <laughs> example. I'll give you a couple of examples. So, well, I'll give you an example. Once, beautiful example, Rav Gifter, one of the great Rosh Hashivas of this generation, the Rosh Hashiva of Tells in Cleveland, he went to a wedding in Chasana in Baltimore. So, they had to travel from Cleveland to Baltimore to the wedding of this, of this young <coughs> Yeshiva Baba. And a group of them went from the Yeshiva. A group of, together with the Rosh Hashiva, Gifta, they went together with this group. They went from Cleveland to Baltimore. They had to make a connection someplace. So the plane stopped in some place, wherever it was, some small place, and they were waiting for a connection to take them onto the wedding in Baltimore. As it happened, the connection was late. And it was so late that by the time they would have got to Baltimore, they would have missed, missed the whole Hasana, and there was no point in going. So there was nothing for it but to wait for the next plane back to Cleveland. They tried. They got, you get reward for trying to do a mitzvah. And uh, they had to wait for the next plane back. While they were waiting for the next plane, plane back to Cleveland, the sun was going down. It was time to daven mincha, afternoon prayer, right? So they wanted a private place in the airport, so, you know, private so they could concentrate daven mincha properly. So they found a janitor. What do you call a janitor in England? Yeah. The caretaker. They found this janitor walking through the airport. It fell out with a big bunch of keys. They, they called him up and they said, look, do you think you could find us a private place where we could get together, make a minion? And we could dive in here. Because the fellow said, sure. He walked them across the airport, and he unlocked a, a room, and the whole minion piled into the room, and they said, they dive in Mincha. At the end of Mincha, as they were about to leave, the janitor at the back of the group, who was waiting the whole time, approached one of the boys at the back of the group, one of the young men, and he said to him in a very hesitant voice, he said, do you think you could help me say Kaddish? So the fellow said, sure. So word for word, he said Kaddish, Right? 
the ja- this man didn't know how to say Kaddish. So this young Yeshiva Baruch said for him Kaddish word for word and he repeated it after him. After this happened, a gifter went up to this janitor and he said to him, I see, you know, I didn't realize he was Jewish. I see you saying Kaddish for somebody. Did somebody die? Janitor said, yes, my father died three days ago. Father died three days ago. Last night he came to me in a dream. And he said to me, son, I want you to say Kaddish for me. So I said, but dad, you never taught me how to do that. You brought me up a form. And where am I going to find a minion? So my father said, don't worry about the minion. It will find you. It's some minion. (laughs) Not just (laughs) slippers. So what happened? They left on a journey. They thought they were going someplace where they thought they were going. That's not where they were going. They thought they were going to the midst of helping some young man get married in Baltimore. They were going to help some Yitzhak Kaddish in Boondocks. <laughs> 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 you don't know that until... It's written back. It's written back then. It's written down back then. But you don't read it till... And when the moment comes... You then can see sometimes that the moment when my father died, my father died. So it so happened that uh, the moment that he died, he was a doctor himself, and there were two colleagues were with him. Two, two doctors were with him at the time that he died. They were standing with him. One happened to be a surgeon, one happened to be a cardiologist. The two doctors who were with him at the time, their names happened to be Dr. Castle and Dr. Dawson. Who were the two doctors who were with him? And they had to fill in the forms that were the last official papers that ever had anything to do with it. They had to sign the certificates, and that's what they had to do. So Dr. Castle and Dr. Dawson signed the certificates, and that short while later, my sister and I were going through my father's papers in Johannesburg. And in the bottom of the chest of his papers, we came across his original medical degrees, his medical and surgical degrees that he had earned at Guy's Hospital here in London 55 years before. One was signed by Dr. Castles and one was signed by Dr. Dawson. I have a friend. You can handle a story, no? <laughs> a story. I have a friend. You have to collect these stories because they show you I have a friend who lives in Johannesburg who, his name's Neville Garber, you can check it out with him. <laughs> <laughs> Not his name, his story. Um, <coughs> who had the following experience. He was uh, brought up like many South Africans with a traditional background, but not knowing, <coughs> not, a, <coughs> not an intensely knowledgeable Jewish background. And when he and his wife got to a certain stage in their life, they wanted to become more involved certain agonizing choices that have to be made. It's not easy. And they decided to move in the direction that many, many younger and not so young people have chosen to move back towards more Jewish knowledge and observance. And in order to do so, and of course they came like many South Africans did from generations, at least one or two generations ago, people who were much more knowledgeable, much more involved. And things had moved away. They decided to move to a place that was more connected. As it happens, they decided to move to an area called Silvermont. It's near Glen Hazel. It's near where Osameach is. They'd be more connected, easier for them to participate and study and so forth. It's a big decision. They bought a a site, a plot, on which a previous home had been demolished, and they decided to build their home over there. The first time they met on that plot, they both told me the story, the first time they met on that site where they built their new home, the following incident occurred. She was standing in the middle of the site and there was only rubble because the previous home had been demolished already in preparation for building their new home. She was standing in the middle of the rubble and as he came across to greet her, they were meeting her to look around and plan what they would do. She saw that he was white and shaky. Now, if you know this particular fellow, you'll know that not much moves him. He's a a tough guy. And what had happened was, while he was walking across the rubble, although it's not his nature, he saw a piece of white card or paper sticking out from between the 
the broken bricks, and although it's not his nature, he had bent down and pulled it out. It turned out to be a wedding photograph of his parents. That had been stolen from their house in Kensington 15 years before. That had been lying on this property that they had now bought to make their home in a move back to where their parents had come from. It had a rust ring around this photograph where they had sat under a barrel. And today it's a beautifully preserved photograph on the mantelpiece of the house they built on that, on that site. What's even more remarkable about this story is that when he told his Rebbe, this, he happens to be a student of one of the great Torah names of this generation, when he went to tell his Rebbe, he ran up to him and he told him this incredible story, you know, you buy a site, I mean, what are the statistical, any mathematicians here? What are the statistical probabilities of... So his Rebbe looked at him with a completely blank expression, said to him, no, no. So he said, uh, he told the whole story again. <laughs> that his, his, his teacher could not understand the point of the story. In other words, you are trying to tell me that there's something moving things. That, that now you realize you needed this to t- until now you weren't sensitive. This is what you needed. <laughs> <laughs> I was witness to an incident where <coughs> I was witness to an incident where another friend of mine <coughs> who lives in Zichon Yaakov. Uh, one more story, yes. <laughs> one more story. He lives in Zichon Yaakov. And he, he experienced the following incident. He, his name is Shmuel Geller, young American rabbi, and he has an interesting history. His grandfather, whose name Shmuel, who was named Shmuel Geller, he's named after his grandfather, was a very learned man who came from Galicia. And he settled in Galveston, Texas. And he was learned, and he was a teacher, a rebbe, and a shaker, and a moil, and he started a cheder, and he had a big family, and they spread all over the United States. And in tribute to him, his grandson, who turned out to be among, among the family, a knowledgeable a young, a young Shiva student, a rabbi, decided to honor his grandfather by writing a book about him, telling his life story and photographs and family tree of all the family. Then he would present a copy to each of the cousins and uncles and aunts to show how great their grandfather was. And he produced a very beautiful book. I have a copy somewhere. It's called From Galicia to Galveston. It has a little photograph of the grandfather and a little ship sailing the waves. And that's what it is. But if you turn the book over, it has a Hebrew... If you look at the book this way, it says from Galicia to Galveston. But if you look at the book this way, there's a Hebrew cover. The reason is that in this part of the book, he printed a... He was, he was handed down in his family a sheaf of notes that his grandfather had written when he was a young man. All those years before, three generations before, when his grandfather was studying in Yeshiva in Galicia, he and a young friend had studied the Gemara together, and they had written their comments and their thoughts, their chadushim on the Gemara, and apparently they were very good. They were handed down in handwritten form to my friend Shmuel, and in tribute to his grandfather, he published them in the book. So that it says here on this cover, it says, Kiddushe Torah, of, and it has Arab Shmuel Geller, and under his name, the name of the young friend, whoever he was all those years before, who wrote these notes with him, and that's what it says. Now when he, when the book came out, he immediately went to the United States with a big suitcase of all these books to go and give out to all his cousins and uncles and so forth. And what happened was this, when he got onto the plane in Tel Aviv, there happened to be an empty seat next to him. And he happened to have a copy of his book with him. And it happened to be lying on the seat. And it happened to be lying with the Hebrew side uppermost. And as he's putting on his seatbelt for takeoff, a young man about his own age, an Israeli, has the yeshiva buffer, you know, the, um, the, the yeshiva system in Israel that do army service and yeshiva studies together. <coughs> this young man was walking to his seat in the plane, stopped, turned around, came back, looked at the book and said, hey, that's my name. He turned out to be the grandson of the friend, Named after his grandfather, just like Shmuel is named after his, and that's how these two young men each other. You know, two young men met each other. Now, when Shmuel got back from America, of course, we don't get excited about these things, right? <laughs> <laughs> when he got back from America, I was present when he went to tell his Rebbe. His Rebbe is one of the great men of, of today, without any question. And I was present when he ran up to tell him the story, and he blurted out this most stupendously unlikely, I mean, you know, bizarre coincidence. When he got through telling this whole story, this great man said to him, exactly like it's completely impassive, I mean, I was present, he said to him, no. <laughs> so Shmuel said, uh, in this very, I'll never forget the voice, I was so fantastic. <laughs> so, Ashbe said to him, slowly as, as enlightenment dawned, he said to him like this, Ata me bi li raya, shakarash bofu ma are you trying to bring me a proof that Hashem, that God runs the world? That's what you're trying to do. That, now, you, that, 
Deci mă se nu e fantastic. Nu se răspunde. Nu se fantastic. Nu se răspunde. 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 Nu Things are going where they have to go. But in seeing things go where they have to go, you have to get the timing right. You have to get the timing right. And you have to move and do things you have to do. You have to do them to fit into that flow of energy which is taking things where they have to go. And you can't miss the time. If you miss it, you miss it. Some things are only given once. You know, the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses. Again, a frightening story. Moshe Rabbeinu Moses was standing on the mountain and when Hashem was speaking to him. So, he said to him, amazing, amazing thing. Moshe, Moses said to Hashem, said to God, show me your glory. Show me, he wanted deeply to see more of Hashem's presence. Right? The, the commentaries say, he felt it was an ace rotso and it was a time of, of gift. It was a time of, you could ask for these things. Hashem was revealing certain things to him and therefore he felt, and this is a spiritual message by the way, it's considered, it's not, it's not ungrateful and, and, and ill-mannered. That's the way you should do it. He gave you a gift, and you thank him, and you ask for more. It, it's for, it, the gift is for your benefit. It's for you to rise, to elevate yourself, to come closer to him. He gave you the gift. You don't say thanks and walk away. You say thanks, I'd like more, so I can get closer. That's your attitude. So when Hashem was showing him, what he was showing him, he wanted to see more, like a spiritually great man always does. Woman. So he said, show me more. So Hashem said to him, no, you can't see more. Human being, while he's alive, cannot see more of me. You can't see more. So Moshe says, and Moshe answered like this. He said to Hashem, but when I was here once before, you offered to show me more. I mean, you have to have a certain amount of chutzpah. You have to know. Not more than a certain amount, but certain. You have to. One spiritual wisdom, you have, to, you have to seek. You have to seek. The opportunity is given, but you have to, you get, you, the opportunity will be there. The teacher will be sent. A teacher and teaching will be sent, but you have to be a mavakesh. You have to be asking. The way the Kabbalists put it is that the outflow is no problem. The problem is, where's your vessel? That the flow is pouring down is never a problem. It's all, always pouring. The question is, you have the vessel to hold it. You have to put your vessel there. The light is always shining. The question is, where's the clay? Where's the vessel that the light shines into? So Moshe turned to Hashem and he said, But you offered to show me more when I stood on this site all that long time ago. <coughs> you remember when Moshe first had his vision at the, at the bush that was burning? It was a long time before. You remember? Then I said, Shall not take off your shoe and come to us, right? Take your <coughs> So Moshe Rabbein, it says, by Yare Mihabit, he was afraid to look. Hashem's presence, you're not talking about this was not some it was Hashem's presence, the presence of Hashem himself, God was manifesting. And in incredible humility, an incredible awe, you know Shemai, he, he, he hid his face. He Yare Mihabit, he was afraid to look. And one opinion in the Gemara is that he was right to do that. He was right in his in his state of it has the correct sense of awe. He was afraid to look directly at the Divine Presence. So he looked away. So when Hashem said to him, no, you cannot see more. So Moshe turned around to Hashem and he said to him, but once you offered to show me more. I was standing in this very spot and you offered to show me more. So, so you were ready to show me. So now I'm ready. And the Gemara records the most amazing words. Amazing words. The words in the Gemara are as follows. Exactly. Exactly. That's what the Gemara says. Then when I wanted, you didn't want. Now you want, I don't want. The commentaries say, it's not a punishment. That was the time. That was the time. There was a time. That was the time. I offered you what you needed at the time. Can't do it now. Now's not the time. The wave's not there now. That was your opportunity. <coughs> The Pasuk says in Shira Shirim, look it up in Shira Shirim, my beloved knocked. But I was in bed, washed my feet, was already in bed, so I said, shall I soil myself, shall I get out of bed and go and open? And then a while later I said, certainly yes, and I ran, but he was gone. He was gone. There's a knock at the door, there's times in life when there's a certain knock at the door. To open the door. Can I keep knocking? So you decide to get up? You know, put it off, who knows? You know how long you're going to be around here?
You can't force it either. You can't push it ahead of time either. You have to sense of timing. The Bnei Prime wanted to go out of Egypt. And they miscalculated the time. They wanted to go out early. They calculated. This is the time. When she said, not the time yet. They forced their way out. They were decimated. To push the hour, to push the time. You can't do that. To wait for the right time. But you mustn't miss it. Reb Chaim Vital writes about the Ari, the great Kabbalistic master of Arizal. One Friday afternoon they went out to greet the Shabbos. You know the custom was, let us go to greet the bride. The custom was, today we don't do it. Today we echo that by turning to face the door. But we sing the Chadodi, greeting the Shabbos bride. So we turn when it comes to the final, yeah, boy, yichala, let we welcome the bride in. We turn towards the door to welcome her in. But they used to go out to greet her, they used to go to the fields. They used to go to the fields, at the Swas, you've ever been to Swas, you've been in those mountains? They used to get out of the city limits, there's other reasons as well, capitalistic reasons to be out of the city. But it doesn't matter, they went out to greet the Shabbos bride, there's a very beautiful idea, a long discussion why you can't wait for it to come to you. <coughs> it's part of the same idea, you wait for it to come to you, who knows if it's going to come. Things that live in the world of Kedusha, you have to go out. You have to go out when they're coming. No use going out when they're not coming. But you have to go out. You have to show that you want. You sit there waiting. This is to go out to greet the Shabbos. So they walked out to greet the Shabbos. The sun was going down over the hills of Tzfas. And Dari suddenly turned to his Talmudim, his disciples, and he said to them, let's go to Yerushalayim. Let's go to Jerusalem. Now Tzfas a long way from Yerushalayim. A long way. And the sun was on the horizon. Before it would be Shabbos and no more movement possible, there were maybe seconds left. <coughs> he said to him, let's go to Yerushalayim. And you know what he meant? He didn't mean sightseeing. He didn't mean the weekend. He meant, let's go to Yerushalayim now, and Shabbos will be the... Who knows what he meant? So there was a moment of electric silence in the group, and one of them said something about just going to inform his family, and Arizal said, we lost it. We lost the opportunity. Reb Chaim Vital, his main, his most famous, greatest Talmud, the one who wrote down all his, all his teachings, writes about his Rebbe. Again, I'll share with you. He writes about his Rebbe, about the Ari. He says that, you can read it in Shifchai Ari. He writes down many things that he learned from, from many personal things that happened to him. He's one of the greatest Torah minds of the last, uh, the, Ari died, the Ari died in 1574. 1574. Talking about a few hundred years ago. And Rebchaim Vital, who succeeded, who, who lived during, who knew him for those two years, just less than two years, Rebchaim wrote down all of his, in many times, in many different ways, he wrote down all the Kabbalistic teachings that he received from, from, from the Ari, which is today's main body of, of Kabbalistic wisdom. Foremost interpretation and body of interpretation and deep insight into the Zohar. He writes the, the following incident that occurred. He writes that after Dari died, he only knew him for close on two years. Dari came from Egypt, from Israel. He found, found Chaim Vital, came to find him, found him in Svas, learned with him, opened his eyes to, to, the, to the deeper deeper wisdom, to the whole, eyes of the whole Jewish people, through him, in fact. And he died. How and why, also, interesting story. After his petira, after his death, the Chaim writes like this, that the Sultan of Jerusalem, the Sultan of Jerusalem, Jerusalem at that time was in the hand of the Muslims, hands of the Muslims, the Sultan of Jerusalem came to him and asked him to open the waters of the Gichon. Now the Gichon is an underground spring that flows through Jerusalem that was sealed up. Again, again, I, I, we have time only to tell the story in its, in its, simple, in its simple terms. We're talking about much deeper things here. Yerushalayim always means there's two kinds of Yerushalayim. Jerusalem has two levels. There's the city and there's the higher Yerushalayim. The water that flows, water is always a symbol of life and of Torah. The water that flows through Yerushalayim in the lower world is a spring that flows through the old city. But in the deeper level, we're talking about something much, much deeper than that. So the waters of the Gichon had been sealed. They were no longer able to flow. Why had they been sealed? Again, it's a long story, but in brief, Many centuries ago, during the reign of King Chizkiah, King Chizkiah, right? If, you, if, you're, if you're an English speaker, Hezekiah. King Chizkiah was the king of Yerushalayim, or Yerushalayim at the time, and he did a number of things that the sages approved. He was a very, very great man, one of the greatest to ever live. He did three things that the sages did not approve of, and three things that the sages did. He hid the book, he hid the book of Rafus, which contained the, the healing from all, all illnesses. 
he did various other things, which was a good thing that he did, incidentally. But the one thing that he did, one of the things that he did that was not approved of by the sages, he sealed the waters of the Gihon. How and why? Not for now. But he sealed the waters of the Gihon. And since then, until this day, they've never flowed. The Sultan, this Arab, this Muslim, knew about this. And he came to Chaim and asked him to open the waters of the Gihon. Reb Chaim Vital was very afraid, very afraid, but he knew that if he refused the wishes of this, this uh, ruler, he'd be killed. So he had himself transported instantaneously to Damascus. <coughs> Certain mystical techniques, <coughs> he had himself transported instantaneously, transmigrated to Damascus, and in fact he, died, he spent the rest of his life there, never came back to Yerushalayim, amazing stories about what happened there, and all. also for another time. Point is, that's where he's buried, he lived in Damascus. He writes that after he got to Damascus, that night, he had a dream. In his dream, his master, his teacher, his Rebbe, the Ari, appeared to him in his dream. And he, the, Rebbe, the, the Ari said to him, what happened today? So he said, I was uh, asked by the Sultan of Yishalayim to open the waters of the Gihon, but I did not want to do that, and so I came immediately to Damascus. So the Ari said to him, why did you not want to open the waters of the Gihon? So Reb Chaim said, I was afraid to use the divine names that would have been necessary to do it. So the Ari said to him, and how did you get to Damascus? He had no answer. So the Ari said to him, do you know, do you know that you're a Gilgul? A Gilgul basically means a reincarnation. You're a Gilgul of Chizkiah. You're a reincarnation of King Chizkiah who sealed up the waters. And do you know that you were sent to the world to reopen them? He sealed them up many centuries ago. You should not have done that. You were sent down to the world again in order to reopen those waters. By the way, the, before, he also says that, uh, that we told him that the Arab, the Muslim, was a, re- was a Gilgul of uh, Sancheriv. Sancheriv. Sancheriv, who battled Chizkiah. That's, that's who he was. He said to him, you were sent to the world to open the waters. And that's your, that was your task. That's what you were brought down to the world for. So, you're talking about cosmic things here. Who knows? So, the Reb Chaim said to him, I'll go straight back tomorrow. And Ari said, today was the day. Today was the day. You were brought down, you were placed there, and today was the day. You can't get tomorrow's night. Anyway, <coughs> let's finish with the uh, message is clear, no? Yes, at this time of year, which is a deep, a time of very, very deep soul searching. I mean, we don't like in these discussions to moralize too much. We like here, choose, prefer to discuss the, as far as we can, the roots of the, these aspects of Torah and Judaism. Each person here is wise enough to, wise enough to learn for himself, for herself, what it is that you have to do here. This is not theoretical wisdom. Obviously, every point in Torah has a practical application. What it is that you need to do, that each of us needs to do, what decision it is that you have to make, and what it is that you have to take on, or take off, or leave off, or move away from, or move towards. That's your... But you can't afford to miss it. Let me finish with a story... I heard from the friend of the person who was involved. And it's written as well. You can read it up yourself. Uh, I subsequently saw it written by him himself. One of the great leaders of jury, (coughs) Shrub. He says, he writes the following thing. He was a young man he went to take leave of the Chavetz Chaim. He had the privilege of learning in Raden. We're talking about 19, 1930, somewhere around there, before the Chavetz Chaim died in 1933. He went to take leave of his great teacher, the Chavetz Chaim. The Chavetz Chaim was a luminary of the generation. I heard from Rav Simcha, Rav Simcha Vassaman told me, he knew the Chavetz Chaim. He told me that anyone who saw the Chavetz Chaim was never the same again. If you ever saw him, you were never the same again. I begin to imagine who he was. Shab writes that he went to say, take his leave from the Chodesh Chaim. He was leaving Yeshiva, he was going, going off, leaving Yeshiva, going off into life, do whatever he was going to do. Well, he became a great luminary in his own right. 
but he went in to take leave of the Chavetz Chaim. As he opened the door and he walked into the Chavetz Chaim's room, before any conversation, the Chavetz Chaim said to him, Are you a Kohen? Kohen? He said, No. Taken aback. Chavetz Chaim, I am. Chavetz Chaim was a Kohen. I am. This is what he came for. He came to say, Get a bracha. Can you get a bracha, right? To send him off into life with a, with a blessing, a bracha. Are you a Kohen? I'm a Kohen. Chavetz Chaim was giving him a bracha. He says, Listen to how he did it. Chavetz Chaim knew what he came for. He said, you know what that means? Because I'm a Kohen and you're not. You know what it means? When the Mashiach comes, in the Messianic Advent, when the Mashiach arrives, and the Temple will be rebuilt, the Mesomikdash will be rebuilt, that's what these three weeks are about, are about, that's what we're moving towards and longing for. That's what, you, yeah, what we are doing is in the higher world, and in the inner world we're trying to rebuild that sanctuary, that place that has Kedusha, right, so that it will then manifest outwardly as the Mesomikdash. When that happens and it's finally rebuilt, we'll all be running. Everyone's going to run. Everybody be running towards Yushalayim. Jewish people be flocking and thronging and running towards Yushalayim. We'll all be running. And when we get to the gates, they'll let me in, but they won't let you in. They'll let me in because I'm a Kohen. Kohanim go inside. They take off their shoes. They go and they do their vote. They serve Hashem directly. They're the ones that make the connection. They won't let you in. You're not a Kohen. You're not allowed in. You know why? Because 3,300 years ago, 3,300 years ago, in the desert of Sinai, there was a critical moment in Jewish history. There was a terrible deed that needed to be done, needed to be done, something had gone wrong, and a heroic action needed to take place. Jews had to go out and risk their lives to do a tremendously heroic act. They had to make war and decimate and destroy a certain faction. For Hashem's honor, it was a very, very terrible moment. And Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses stood up in the camp and he shouted, Mil Hashem Eli, whoever's for Hashem, come to me, to me. And Mil Hashem, who is for Hashem to me? And instantaneously, my forefathers, the tribe of Levi, they flocked towards Moshe. They ran instantaneously. They heard the call, Mil Hashem Eli. They flocked towards him. And yours didn't. They hesitated. And the result is that now, down this end of history, I am descended from Kohanim. And because of that, they were given the privileges, they were given the merit. They, they became the Kohanim and serve Hashem directly, they'll be allowed in. But yours hesitated. Your, your, your forefathers hesitated. And therefore, you don't have that privilege. And then he paused. And he said to him, now that you're leaving, you're leaving this place, you're going off into life. Somewhere or other in your life, sooner or later, you're going to hear a call. You'll hear a cry. And the cry will be, Mila Shem Eli, whoever's for him, to me. Make sure when you hear that call, you run. 